Good afternoon. I suggest we just start. Thank you all for joining us for understanding every line of your code base. Let me introduce uh, Victoria, who is a developer at uh, Collective Idea and focuses on Android and Rails. Um, and this is Boris. He's a partner engineer at Google. He focuses on Android partnerships and specializes in Android and Java binary analysis. Um, so today, we're going to do an introduction to the Java and Kotlin um, build pipeline, so understanding what they compile to, how they compare to each other, um, so that we can see what that means going from Java to Kotlin. And then we're also going to use that information as a tool, um, take advantage of that build pipeline to help us understand our Kotlin. So actually, yes. We want all of you to use your Java skills to ramp up and work effectively with Kotlin. And the goal is to understand Java Kotlin language interoperability. Let's start by discussing Java and Kotlin languages build pipeline. So yeah, that's uh, the usual 101 intro to Java course, how Java is compiled. We got a bunch of uh, Java files. We apply the Java C tool. We create, uh, we get a bunch of class files. Then we apply a DX or one of the newly released Google D8 array tools. And we get a nice entry, which has a name classes.dex. If you would open your Android APK by unzipping it, you see uh, one, two, or maybe more classes.dex entries inside your Android app. And this is where all your Kotlin and the Java executable code lives in. Ah, yeah. For the ones uh, who love to see things in binary, this is how the class file looks like. If you see in the blue on the top the cafe baby sign, which is a binary format for knowing that this is a class file. So yeah, what are the class files? They are a result of a Java C Java compiler invocation. That's a binary format not pleasant for humans to read. Uh, if you think about it, they have a pretty uh, simple uh, structure and usually can be represented as a C struct with a class name, version, and other lovely details, such as uh, constant pool, interfaces, fields, and internals of your methods. And essentially, if you look uh, here, this is a nice uh, bump of the string table then all this stuff on the right side are all the strings and types that your class is using. Now, welcome to the Dex files. How many of us are Android developers? Okay, how many of us know what is a Dex format? Excellent, you are in the right room. So, uh, Dex file is hardly more interesting to read and uh, less straightforward versus the class file. So it's a result of a DEX or a radiate to invocation. Please know that many classes, uh, many your Java or Kotlin classes, result usually in one DEX file. Data from all the classes is merged into tables, methods that uh, should be less than uh, 65K method limit. How many of us are familiar with 65K method limit multi-DEX? Great. For those who don't, we are going to talk about it in a second. Also important to know what makes DEX files are more challenging to read and to understand is they have a totally different encoding method and everything is done, as we all know on Android, we are on uh, memory constrained devices. So we need to squeeze every possible bit of uh, performance. Ah, and yes, speaking of uh, multi-DEX, Stick, uh, we got a 16 bits field for all methods per uh, one classes.dex file entry. Two to the power of 16 should be 64K. If you don't believe me, check at home. And it includes both defined and used uh, use the methods. So yeah, and this is, I would say, one of the most important uh, slides of uh, this uh, presentation. As we are on the Kotlin conference, Let's uh, talk for a moment how Kotlin actually fits 
in our Android and uh, Java pipeline. Okay, the top part for the chart is pretty straightforward. You know, introduction to Java 101, Java files, class files. And then here, how Kotlin comes in. As we have a bunch of uh, Kotlin files, where we write our Kotlin uh, source code, we apply the Kotlin C2 made by JetBrains, and guess what? The result is class files. And then we got more class files than we usually have uh, together without, uh, with our Java sources. And this is great. So the next tool has more files to process. And now think of it for a moment. And here is the key point of this presentation. The Dex tool, or any OJVM, or whatnot, they don't care who created these class files. It could be Java compiler, it could be Kotlin compiler, it could be any one of us playing with uh, libraries of zeros and ones. As long as we are fit to the binary standard of the class files, we are good. And thus we have all the power of Kotlin ecosystem and Java ecosystem as one piece. And this is how we achieve the full language interoperability. With my Kotlin code, I can use uh, any Java library that was written, I don't know, 10 years ago. This is how it works behind the scenes, because they are compiled down to the same binary format, which can be used by both Android, Java, DX, D8, R8, whatnot. And also your favorite uh, IDs also know how to read the uh, class files and essentially Java files and provide you data as you develop. One of the reasons we all use and love them. So yeah, how Kotlin fits in. Kotlin compiler generates class files and also as we have seen in the keynote, uh, JavaScript and other formats. Please note that one Kotlin file might have a few class files and Victoria is going to talk about it in the next uh, slides. As we discussed, the stuff is 100% interoperable with Java language binary format. And the side effect of it, Kotlin can be added incrementally. Because as, as we discussed in the previous slide, all the runtime tools, they don't care who wrote the class files, as long as they are correct. So yeah, Java language interoperability is one of the Kotlin language fundamentals. The syntax is very similar, but not compatible to Java. And there are a lot of good talks about it in this conference. However, we can use uh, Java ecosystem libraries and tools with Kotlin as we're using with the Java language. Great. Now let's uh, talk uh, briefly the opposite direction. How can we get from a Kotlin code to the Java code? The first question is why? And I would say, for me, the main reason is curiosity. Because this is something that I th we think it's the best trait of the best developers is they're curious. They want uh, to learn and to understand how the, their stuff works. And I hope this is the reason why all of you are here. Uh, we are super happy to see the room packed, so thank you. So once you understand how the stuff is working, you can make uh, trade-off uh, decisions. Which library to use, which dependency to add. You can assess performance. You can assess your APK size and method count. It's all these things are super related. So, and as we discussed in the keynote, Android Studio and IntelliJ provides us uh, the best tooling for these things. So here we can see the Kotlin code on the left side and the equivalent uh, bytecode representation on the right side. To be honest, I don't expect you to do and start looking at all of this right now, but this is a tool that you should have, uh, you should have in your arsenal when other or more easier methods don't work. So uh, to wrap up with this part, your Java language knowledge is valuable with Kotlin. This is an asset that you have and you can now leverage it. It's pretty easy to start and get uh, Kotlin code working. Both, uh, both Java and Kotlin do generate class files. And uh, JVM, Dex tools know how to read them. And there is a tooling to help you with. 
Okay, great. So now we know um, how the build pipeline works and how both Java and Kotlin um, both are compiled down to those class files. Because of this, we can take advantage of that and use it to take advantage of our knowledge of Java to help us better understand some of these Kotlin language features. Because Kotlin compiles down to bytecode, we can decompile that bytecode into Java and make use of that Java knowledge that we have to help us understand that. So um, for the examples here, I used the um, decompiler in IntelliJ Android Studio. Um, there's lots of other ones. There's the um, Classy Shark bytecode viewer. There's others. Um, but the one that I used is in IntelliJ. Um, and the first thing I ever tried was a simple user class. So this is small, it's simple, easy enough to understand. Um, it's concise, just the information that we need. We have a user class with one property name. Um, it's a string. It's a non-null string. Um, null, nullability is built into the type system. Um, here we're using a string that is never null. It's also immutable because we're using val instead of r. So let's take the bytecode from this and see the equivalent Java. And the result is this. At the top, we have our imports. And then there's some metadata that's used by IntelliJ and Kotlin extensions to get um, some type safety information um, and other things. I'm going to omit the imports and the metadata in future examples, and we're going to focus on the rest of it. So this. We have our user class. It is final by default. Then we have our field name. It's private. It's final. It has the not null annotation. And then we also have our getter for it. Notice there's no setter. This is because we use val. It is immutable. And then we have our constructor. Notice at the beginning there is a check parameter is not null. Um, nullability is built into the type system, but if you're using it with some Java libraries or other things that don't have that nullability built into the type system, it won't catch everything. So um, there's this extra check there to make sure it's not null before we use it. Um, from this, we can understand what it means to have a Kotlin class through looking at this equivalent Java. We can also look at a data class. To make something a data class, we are just adding the keyword data to the beginning of the class declaration. And I could, at this point, describe what a data class is, but it would be so much more fun to look at the Java equivalent. So here's what we have. Um, this is just the new part. It has all of this plus the stuff that we looked at before. So zooming in a little bit, we have a component one. There are components for each of the public properties. We only have one property name. So we have component one. This is used for destructuring class declarations. If we had two properties, say first name and last name, there'd be component one and component two. Um, here, component one is just returning name. If we had first name and last name, like component one might return first name, and component two might return last name. Then we have a copy method, a two string method, a hash code, and an equals. And most of these are implemented in a way that you might expect. What's a bit more interesting is the copy. Um, this has a synthetic bridge method. This is um, used by the JVM to give you as a developer a couple different options. Um, you can make a direct copy of the object or change some of the properties when you copy it. So if you want to change the name when you make it a copy of the object, you could do that. You see similar synthetic bridge methods um, with these masks if you do other things like named properties or named parameters. So uh, classes and data classes are really cool. Um, one of the other main things in Kotlin is the nullability that's built into the type system. Um, and then we have some different options for doing those null checks. Um, because nullability is built into the type system, if something is marked as nullable, we are forced to check for null before we use it um, with something that needs a non-null value. Otherwise, it just won't compile. 
We notate that something is nullable with the question mark. So middle name here is nullable because we have string question mark. Um, we're assigning a value to it by calling the method get middle name. Um, and then we call dot length on it. We're using the null sa the safe call operator here um, to check for null before we, we call dot length. So what this will do is if middle name is not null, it'll call dot length on it. Otherwise, um, it will not. It'll return null. So when we decompile the bytecode from this, we see that it does a null check before calling dot length. Through this, we can analyze multiple different null safety features to get a better understanding how they work. If you don't totally understand what these characters, this random question mark is in the middle of it, um, this is what it's doing. This example is very similar, but instead of calling a method, we are directly assigning a string to it. So we know that the string is not null, and we are assigning it to an immutable value. Because of this, because we know we are assigning a non-null value to an immutable variable, it takes out that null check for it. The compiler knows it could not possibly be null, so it doesn't bother checking. Another thing that's a fun language feature in Kotlin are extension functions. In Java, we might use uh, utility classes with utility methods instead, um, those static methods. Um, what's nice with these extension functions is it allows us to call these functions directly from an instance of that object. So here, we're creating an extension function on string, on nullable string, to see if the string is empty. To do that, we um, dot the method name to the class name, so string question mark, because it's on nullable string, and then dot is empty, and we return a Boolean, and then in the body, we're just checking if the string is null or if the length is zero. And then we have this in a file that we're calling string ext.kt. So when we call it, we can call it directly from an instance of the object. This is a bit different if you're used to working in Java. So let's see what's happening um, looking at the bytecode that's the equivalent to the Java. So we see this, and we see that it's essentially doing the same thing that we might do manually with a utility class. Um, we have our string ext kt class. Um, that's the same name as the file. You, there are annotations you could rename it with if you wanted. Then we have our public static file method is empty. Um, the variable, or the value that we were calling it on from Kotlin is instead passed in as the first parameter. And then we perform the same operation that we wanted to perform. And then when it's called, it is called just like a static utility class with that value passed in as the first parameter. In fact, if you wrote this extension method in Kotlin and wanted to use it in some bit of Java code that you have in your project, this is how you would do it. So through doing this exercise, you now know that using these extension functions have a similar behavior and performance if you used a static utility class. So I really like Lambda, so what would be if I didn't talk about them? Um, Kotlin has um, lambdas and higher order functions. Um, so let's talk about those for a second and what that looks like using this, um, this tool. So here we have a function that we pass in a string and another function. It's printing out the string that's passed in, performing the given operation on it, and printing out the result. To pass in the function, we have the um, input in parentheses, an arrow, and then the output. So that's the type of the function. We are, and then we call it in the body, just like you would another function using that name. We're also making this an inline function, which means that where it's used, the compiler will generate the code to insert into the body where it is used. And we'll see what that means in a second. 
um, to look at the equivalent Java. Here it is here. Um, and for passing in that function, it's passing in a function one object. Function one is an interface that has one method invoke. The one corresponds to the number of parameters. We only have one parameter, one string. So it's function one. If we passed in, say, two strings, it'd be function two. But here, it's function one. So then inside the body, it's checking that the parameter is not null. It's printing out the before string, calling function dot invoke to perform that operation, and then printing out the result. So what about when we call this function? To call it, when we pass in the lambda, we have it within curly braces. We have our input variable, an arrow, and then the operation we want to perform. Here, we're just concatenating the given string with the word world. Um, we don't have to put that string arrow if we just want it to default to a variable named it. We can also put it outside the parentheses, um, different ways we can call it. So what happens when we look at the equivalent Java for this? And it almost looks like we copied and pasted the code right in there because it is an inline function. It inserts the body of the method right into where it's being used for this inline function. So we have our start string that's printed out. We perform the operation on it. And then we print out the result. So what happens, though, if a function is not in line? This can help us understand um, how we can make that decision if we want to make a function in line or not. So what happens if it's not in line? Here, all we did was remove that inline keyword. And we get this null.instance um, that is very different from the almost copy and paste example that we saw before. Um, so really, what does that mean? In order to understand this, to look at the bytecode, um, I never knew I was going to enjoy looking at bytecode until I did. Um, it's kind of a puzzle. So let's see what we get. This is most of the bytecode that it's referencing, not all of it, but these are all the parts that we're going to look at. We are just going to step through piece by piece um, so you don't have to look at a complete, complete wall of text. Um, so starting at the top, we have our final class. It's called this whole path name um, Lambda Example 1. It extends lambda, and then it implements function one. We talked about the function one interface before, having the one method invoke, which comes next. We have our invoke method. And it takes a string as a parameter. And then it's also checking that that parameter is not null, with that same check parameter is not null that we saw before. After that, we have our implementation. This first creates a string builder. It uses that string builder to concatenate the given string with the word world. And then it calls to string to build that string, and then essentially returns it. The other part that I wanted to point out is this static instance. This is what's being referenced when we saw that null.instance before. It's initialized in the class init. Um, and when the bytecode is decompiled into Java, the decompiler might um, omit some of these inner classes for brevity. And because of that, in the Java, we don't have this class to reference. So it put null there in place, which is why we saw that funky null.instance. So through looking at this example, we understand that if we use an inline function, it inserts the code directly into where it's being used. If it's not in line, it's creating an, an object for this function that we're performing. 
if you're concerned about that object being created, especially if you're using this function a lot, then you can understand the performance implications of it. You can use this tool to understand lots of other options that you have in Kotlin when you're trying to decide between things and understand possibly the performance implications, as well as if you're just curious to understand how a particular language feature works. Uh, in order to be completely fair, let's talk for a moment about the costs of having Kotlin as a part of our uh, APK. And it turn out, turns out that not that much. As all we know, we got uh, between five to 6,000 uh, method count and roughly around one uh, megabyte uh, library size with all the types that uh, we need to include uh, inside our uh, Android uh, app. So the runtime you find all the relevant types and uh, basic utilities that, co that our Kotlin code uh, needs. Uh, what we talk here, uh, we sometimes write about it, so uh, here are the references. They are too long. We don't expect you even uh, to start reading it, but uh, take a look at our uh, uh, Twitter profiles where we update uh, with our latest and greatest articles about the subject. All right. So the things that we've learned today, um, the Kotlin language and Java language, they're very interoperable. They both use the same class files and dex files. Um, and you can use all the Java libraries that you would use. Um, you can use them in your Kotlin projects. We can also inspect these class files and dex files to better understand the size, the performance, the implementation of your Kotlin code. And you can make decisions and observations based on that. And then you can also use this as a tool to better grasp some of the specific Kotlin language features, whether it's out of curiosity or you're just really trying to wrap your head around something specific. I want to thank you all for coming. Questions? Comments? Just a sec. Yes, sir? I'm here. Is there any Kotlin feature that generated some really odd Java code to you guys? Is there any just really odd looking Java code that was generated at all? You mean, uh, there was a question about is there code generated that's not uh, efficient? Or it looks uh, weird that you wouldn't write by hand? Uh, to be honest, from what uh, we have been working on, I have never seen much of this, uh, just uh, on the contrary. So I was uh, really surprised once evaluating performance on uh, switch cases to see that the actual uh, Kotlin uh, compiler generated bytecode was uh, pretty efficient and uh, using uh, low level stuff that uh, I couldn't write uh, by hand. Mm -hmm. There are, I guess, uh, could be cases that uh, the code uh, which is generated is not optimal. But uh, for those, uh, as we discussed, you got the tools uh, to take a look at, to inspect. And if needed, uh, to rewrite, mm -hmm. either uh, using uh, a different API uh, with Kotlin or uh, with uh, Java, or even uh, raise a bug to the Kotlin team. They definitely will be happy to hear on where they can uh, improve. Mm -hmm. And as far as like weird stuff, like there's like what we saw before with the null dot instance. That can be weird when you're um, looking at the Java equivalent. Um, as well as like named parameters, looking at the mask. That's not always inter intuitive looking at it at, at first glance. Uh, but as far as the optimization, I agree with the things that Boris said. More questions, comments? Hi, I'm curious how the reified uh, types are handled in the bytecode for Kotlin. Once again, can you repeat the question, please? The reified types. JVM by default has type erasure. Ah, the generics. The generics. Yeah, you mean. OK, if, uh, first, uh, thanks for the question. It's definitely not an easy one, and it touches one of the nicest uh, corners uh, of the Java programming uh, language, and uh, deals with things like contravariance, uh, invariance, and covariance. 
and uh, who knows what all of them are welcome to raise hands. I, thank you, I usually confuse, great, maybe have even uh, better p people to answer the audience than myself because I always confuse between them. And let's be honest, Java generics are hard. And especially are hard when, user, when uh, doing generics, not as a user, but as the library author. As uh, you know, a producer expects, a consumer uh, provides, or whatever the rules. And with Kotlin, they definitely made a lot of things easier and optimized the common uh, case. And now back uh, to your questions, how they are exactly handled. This is exactly the topic or the subject that we wanted to deliver. Take any Kotlin code or Java code and inspect. Thus, if you see on a real runtime level what's going on, you will see the optimizations for generics. You will see cases where uh, Kotlin or uh, Java C uh, remove types. And even if you take a look here, uh, let me, uh, the, one of the metadata that coming in, it also includes a bunch of data that uh, Kotlin Runtime uses to understand where the types uh, coming in. This is a decompiled uh, class uh, that was built with a, a Kotlin compiler. And just note the metadata uh, field here. So all in all, to wrap up your question, at least to address all the possible incarnations with uh, generics, write a code, inspect it, and uh, make uh, decisions of where to go. More questions, please. Let me see more hands. Ah, yeah. Yes, sir? Um, so I was wondering, you know, you showed that whenever you inline a function, it basically just kind of seems to copy the code into place. Mm -hmm. um, are there any kind of downsides to this? Like, are there any reasons why you wouldn't just inline everything? Um, I don't really have a reason why. Usually I feel like, oh yeah, there's that one, code size. But before we jump to this, let's just get back to a real issue. Okay, let's say you have a bunch of uh, lambdas, some of them in line, some of them are not in line. Speaking on the Android perspective, the first uh, step of the optimization is understand what code is causing me troubles because uh, it could be a bad idea to start uh, optimizing in wrong places. So if you have uh, a mission critical code such as, I don't know, a drawing loop or inner loop optimization in database, then I would consider this. But uh, based on my experience for quite a few years dealing with this, the amount of code that requires actual optimization on such level is usually pretty small. So I would first check before uh, jumping out to a heavy artillery such as replacing invoke dynamic with uh, invoke statics or uh, trying to minimize the number of objects. And you know what? Worst case scenario, fine. You have lambda. It adds, I don't know, five, seven methods. Is it something critical to your method count? So to ramp up, please first uh, analyze and test if this code uh, causes you performance uh, issues. More questions, please. Do we see any hands? Nope. So I think that means lunch. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.